an addict named David J. Hey, David. What's up for Wagner? Hey. So uh, I want to say welcome to our family members that uh, are new. You are the most important person at a meeting, without a doubt. And over a period of time, you'll appreciate that you were at one time, and you'll be glad that somebody else is. <laughs> I want to say thank you to our predecessors. Without you, we do not understand our history. And when any organization doesn't understand its history, they're doomed to repeat the mistakes of yesterday. I want to thank the trusted servants. All the committee members that are in here today, would you please stand up? So uh, for those of us that understand the tediousness, and too many hours in a hard chair on a soft butt, wondering why we're going over the same stuff, you wonder if it's really God's will when you're in the middle of a, a committee. You know, what I want to tell you about is that uh, your trusted servants gathered together on Thursday night to get themselves ready to give you a five-star celebration experience of Narcotics Anonymous and that of fellowship. They read the Just for Today on Thursday night, August the 30th. And the reason why it really stood out to me was that this year's theme is a time to pause and a chance to change. Now, it's hard to find those things in the literature. And I looked, and I thought, well, I'm going to have to come out of my own experience. Because if, for all the themes and logos that were submitted and that was chosen, there's a reason why. So this was Thursday's reading. It says, uh, August 30th, doing good and feeling good. We examine our actions, reactions, and motivations. We often find that we've been doing better than we've been feeling. Basic text, page 42. The way we treat others often reveals our own state of being. When we are at peace, we are most likely to treat others with respect and compassion. However, when we're feeling off-center, we're likely to respond to others with Ill intolerance and impatience. When we take regular inventory, we'll probably notice a pattern, why we treat others badly when we feel badly about ourselves. What may not be revealed in an inventory, however, is the other side of the coin. When we do treat others well, we feel good about ourselves. We add this positive truth to the negative facts that we've been finding about ourselves in our inventory. We begin to behave different. When we feel badly, we can pause to pray for guidance and strength. We make a decision to treat others around us with kindness, gentleness, and the same concern we'd like to be shown. A decision to be kind may nurture and sustain the happiness and peace of mind we all wish for. The joy we inspire may lift the spirits of those around us and in turn foster our own good spiritual well-being. Just for today I will remember that I can change my actions and my thoughts will follow. So I don't think anybody on that uh, convention committee knew that that, that uh, Thursday's reading was going to be part of the theme. And that's when you know when you've been serving on a service body that it truly has been God's will for the push me, pull you, the differences, and hopefully the ties that bind us together are stronger than those that would tear us, ourselves apart. I. Uh, I owe the best part of my addiction and the worst part of my addiction to the great state of Texas. <laughs> I'd like to dedicate this share to my son, Corey. And the reason why is that uh, I went out for a pack of cigarettes in 19... 
82, and I didn't come back. He was one years old, and I chose my addiction over my son that I watched be born. The words that came out of my mouth, finally, I have a family. We're not strong enough. I hear a lot about willpower, and my willpower has never been able to do for me what you and the program of Narcotics Anonymous has done for me. That's to give me a day clean, a day one, a day at a time. My mother calls me a world-class quitter. She says she's never seen anybody come out of the blocks like me and unable to finish the race. Uh, I would say that I'm a criminal addict, most of my uh, using. The problem is I wasn't a very good one. But there is a lot to be said about consistency. <laughs> so running from a string of felonies in New England, I wound up here. I think at that time we flew into Love Field. And uh, there was a bunch of construction going out in Garland. And I went to work out there. That's what I did was construction. And uh, I got lucky. We went uh, over to the Garland Yacht Club after work. <coughs> to have a few beers and shoot some pool. And uh, I caught the attention of this woman that was 20 years my senior. Now, I know that you look at me, but I got to tell you, at one time, I was young and pretty. <laughs> and like everybody else with clean time around here, most of us, our hair and our memory are the first things to go. She owned the largest uh, truck insurance brokerage in the state of Texas. And she did not know how to say no. She would not say no. Whether it was a 61 Corvette, hardtop convertible, whether it was a, a, a guard dog named Lucifer that outweighed me, whether it was an arsenal that any substation would be proud to have, or 110 acres that I could practice my horticultural efforts. <laughs> The thing about Texas women, as you well know, when they love you, they love you, regardless of. And when I'd get arrested, her and the bondsman would be there before I got there in the police car. You know what I mean? The codependence thing. Love you to death. She sure tried hard. In Narcotics Anonymous, our slogan is different. We say we love you until you learn how to love yourself. And that's something I've never been able to do. I suffer from a degree of loneliness and depression that probably should have took me out a long time ago. I would like to tell you that it was my God's will for me to use for those 16 years I did. That's not true. And how I found that out was in a four-step, sorting out the contradictions and the confusion of my active addiction. The other thing is that I need to tell you that drugs saved my life. When you see these people doing these things on the TV, I would say most of their relatives reside in the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous. And if it wasn't for a proven program of recovery and the therapeutic value of one addict helping another, we'd have a whole bunch of people running around with guns, capping other people and then finally capping themselves. Because that's what this disease does. Jails, institutions, derelictions, and death. And we usually never want to exit the party alone. I uh, went to treatment at the uh, substance abuse unit at Terrell State Hospital. You know what I mean? I stood in line with the hospital Johnny on and uh, the shoelaces taken out of my shoes and uh, waiting for the Thorazine to do its job and telling the guy next to me, bef behind me, that I got it going on. Can I roll one homeboy? See? The reality of my life never matched up to the fantasy. The reason why that uh, substance abuse treatment center stands out to me is because there was an H9 meeting that came in. And the gentleman was here from the Fort Worth area. He had zero T cell count. And he was grateful to be clean, grateful to be living with AIDS. No one 
that sooner or later that that disease was going to take his life. And people were scared to death in the 80s. You know, if you hug somebody or sit on the toilet after them, you get it. <laughs> you know, if you hug somebody or sit on the toilet after they relapse, you could get it. Oh, that's not true? <laughs> Shit, I'm shocked how some of us act. That ruined my using. Upon my exit of that uh, program, the psychiatrist followed me out to the parking lot, and he said, the reason why we said that you had little or no chance of staying clean is that you're surrounded by codependents. You still have a bunch of resources, and you are one of the most manip manipulative people we've ever dealt with. I don't know how you got that turkey in here on Thanksgiving. <laughs> that wasn't fair to the rest of the clients. Hey, I shared, you know what I mean? I'm a breast man, personally. But. <laughs> The last thing he said to me, he stayed with me for the rest of my life. He said, I'm a member of Narcotics Anonymous. And what I would strongly suggest to you is to stay away from old playmates, playgrounds, and playthings. That you attend a meeting, at least one meeting a day for 90 days. Not 90 meetings in 90 days. You tell me that, I'll do them all on Saturday before football on Sunday. <laughs> you know what I mean? If one vitamin is good, a handful will work. We need to be careful what we tell the newcomer. A lot of stuff sounds really good, hasn't been thought out. I stayed clean five and a half months. I white knuckled it on the grace of God. And the love of long-term members in Garland, Texas, when I was interested in talking about war stories, when the thing I said the most was, I know, I know, I know, I know that I heard a loud pop when my head came out of my... The reason why we say that, please, give yourself a break and listen, is that until I can hear the message, I can't learn how to start applying the message or live it. So... If what you have to carry is the mess and the war stories, believe me, the rest of us are well qualified. I uh, have to go back a little bit in time. Uh, it was at that time that the boys from Humble Boat and the boys from Berkeley had come up with a little seed. This seed had stripes on it. This seed had its own biological clock. You didn't have to wait till late October for it to start pushing up buds. In 90 days, this thing was done. It was called a nine-day wonder, kind of like I was when I was new. You know what I mean? Shit, I found everything y'all missed in the basic text. You know? Why I lived there and the insanity of that. And I got to tell you, you know, uh, my story is one, uh, one of being extremely successful when I participated in my addiction. The problem is that marijuana was the only thing that I could actually sell and poison other people with and turn a profit. It didn't matter how big the other bag was. I, I bought a quarter pound of cocaine once. I didn't make enough money back to get another lighter when mine. Although I do love war stories, if you ever get a chance to go on a road trip with Jim W. from Carlsbad, New Mexico, you need to ask him about a couple of his stories and the Border Patrol. You will laugh so hard you might think that, was that, did I really fart? <laughs> if you're a committee member and you're thinking about a, t a good topic meeting, I would like to suggest one addict's experience of going to meetings around the world. And my friend Jim has. <laughs> and what amazing stories he has in Narcotics Anonymous recovery. The pictures, the stories, as well as his service resume. So uh, if you do call him, you can tell him I'm to blame. Okay? I'd like to say uh, thank you to my dear friends 
from Oklahoma City, the South Side group. Jimmy, Mary, and Jason that drove all the way down here to support me. Because you know what? Uh, I'm like a timeshare condominium. You don't know who you're going to get on any given day. Really. My cousin Sybil has nothing on me. You know what I mean? I want to thank my brother, Lewis, and his lady, Jonna, from the Here and Now group in Lubbock for coming. Because that's what we do. We make relationships that stand the test of time. Regardless of, we put our energy, our emotion, our time, and most of all, our care into one another. That is the only thing that has worked for me, is the unconditional love of Narcotics Anonymous. Now, I would like to tell you that uh, I'm a pretty damn smart addict. I have two uh, parents that are PhDs, and uh, like my mother said, I was the most successful quitter she knew. And I have some of, seen some of the finest psychiatrist that the penal system has to offer. <laughs> as well as my parents. You know what I mean? God bless them. You know? They did everything they could. Intellect is no match for the disease of addiction. Uh, the problem with those uh, therapy sessions, for those of you coming out of a therapeutic uh, community that are going to teach us something. Uh, the best thing you got in that therapeutic uh, community setting was an NA schedule because most of my therapy sessions were cut short because they wanted to talk about my childhood and my mother, and I like to talk about their mother. So uh, I wound up back at the cell quite often, rather quickly. The end of the line for me was uh, San Quentin Prison. Committed a crime I don't have no memory of. And I wound up in a hole because I get in trouble no matter where you put me. See, I used to say, well, if it wasn't for them or her or because they snitched, you know what I mean, or the town went dry, I would have paid them. You know what I mean? Uh, I do like to go to court for the arraignment. That's about the only hearing I like. Uh, Ronald Reagan... Uh, changed the law that it used to be you could run for seven years and they wiped out everything besides the capital offense. Uh, he ruined that for me. He's still on my four step. <laughs> Him and that chimpanzee. Um, there's nothing worse for me to be in my own skin and have to deal with my own emotions and my thoughts, and to be visited by the ghosts of the past this far off my nose, laying on this steel bunk. I'm used to penitentiaries that are loud. All of a sudden, you got top 40 singers, you got evangelists, you got people that decided that they're going to open up their old burger stand. Now you wonder, really, how much lead paint is on one of them steel bunks. And they're going to make real cheese sandwiches. I'm going to buy them. Now, who was stupider? Huh? I'm used to, like, people saying, I'm going to go crazy if you don't let me out of here. And then you have those people that decided that they don't like Smokey the Bear. And they will light everything on their cell on fire. Now, that is a good cell block to me. You know what I mean? Regular TV ain't got nothing on that. <laughs> Death Row is a completely different story. It's quiet. Quiet like a tomb. Quiet <clears throat> like a funeral home. And those guys didn't talk. I used to take toilet paper and toothpaste and roll it up into a ball just so I could hear a noise once it hardened and I'd throw it out into the tear. And it'd go ding, dong, ding. Because I was going crazy. I used to think that I'd been chipped by the government. I did. I ain't alone, huh? I cut all the wires from underneath the house. You know how it is. <laughs> Laughter is a sign of recognition and also the rate, the depth of our sickness and the rate of our recovery. So it's good to see that I'm not that far behind. What I didn't understand until I started 
writing out the steps was all that static in my head was not being broadcast from the outside in. It was being broadcast from the inside, between my ears, out. So I would assume all kinds of things. Somebody was schizophrenic at the airport because they were walking around talking to themselves. Little did I know they had a Bluetooth earpiece. <laughs> I creamed him on his inventory. I'm grateful I didn't have to do his nine step for him. <laughs> when I assume I make an ass out of myself and I lose the opportunity of really finding out how wonderful you are. Um, my old lady, my hostage, sent me a radio. Now, I've only been good at two things, right? So I got clean. You know what I mean? I was committing crime and selling drugs. And the other was dancing in the sheets. So I, I kept me an old lady. You know what I mean? Uh, my thing was the first thing I looked at was the purse. If it was a Gucci or a coach, it was on. <laughs> that other thing, Kmart stuff, didn't work for me. You know what I mean? You gotta have money to get stay high, you know what I mean? Love may make the world go round, but it don't help with Chewy, you know what I mean? <laughs> so she sent me this radio and had these headphones, and we were listening to the blues on K Fog. And music is the only thing that has ever been, had the ability to take me out of myself, you know what I mean? And take me to another time and place of comfort and ease, you know? To relive those memories of infatuation, brotherhood, accomplishment, desire, murderous rage. And I heard the jingle keys come down the tier, bing, ding, dong. Here he is, standing in front of my cell. And he says to me some very ugly stuff. He said uh, to me, he said, uh, hey, genius, I knew he was talking to me. I've been called that my whole life at my house. <laughs> He said, uh, headphones are for your head. Maybe you know the kind of arrogance and willful obstinance that I've lived my whole life. That was to prop up almost non-existent self-esteem. Most of my life, my self-esteem was like this cup of water. You say something nice to me, my self-esteem level goes up. You say something ugly to me, pour it out. Today, my self-esteem... It's like a water bottle with a cap. Only two of us, me and the guy of my understanding, can either put in or take out. And that's a gift that's available to all of us if we'll just work the 12 steps. You see the people that come here, they do everything else. Get four jobs, you know what I mean? Take 16 units on their college, right? Try to have sex with everybody that uh, even shows an interest. And then they tell you, I don't know why I got loaded. <laughs> really? Like, have you seen those guys? Like, they're decked out in their Harley Davidson gear, and then you ask them what kind of motorcycle you got. Oh, I ain't got a bike. <laughs> I was like, to wear this shit. Well, why be a member of a 12 step program if you're not going to work all 12 steps? It ain't rocket scientists. So, uh, he said, enjoy the music. I'll come back at the end of the shift and get that radio. I said, uh, whatever. The feeling of impending doom, I hated that. Am I going to make it down to the dope track without getting pulled over? Is he going to be in pocket? Is it any good? Can I drag that syringe across that matchbook one more time? Huh? Uh, where is my straight shooter? Hmm? Did I steal a lighter for the last time I was at that bar? You know, the important stuff. Five thirty came and went, they served breakfast, they served that little lunch, you know that bologna that's in that plastic that's good till two thousand twenty, you don't have to keep it refrigerated. <laughs> don't let the smooth taste fool you. Hmm? By 9 a.m., he shows up and grabs my radio. He said, I can take it nicely or we can come in there, 
give you the cattle prod. They call it a taser, but you know, when, you, when, you, when you're cattle, you know you're cattle. You know what I mean? It definitely got my attention. It takes quite a bit to get my attention, but a little uh, electrotherapy will get my attention. Running out of dope will get my attention really bad. And you having a big bag will really get my attention. He took my music. I went and did my time, and I got out, and I thought about that correctional officer a lot. When I got out, uh, the morning that they told me I was being released, I, this little grumble started. There was this little dark dot in the horizon, and, and it just kept coming closer and faster and bigger. And this uh, little gurgling started into my stomach was making some moves. And I had, uh, you know, prison is the only place where uh, men drug addicts at the end of the road uh, iron their clothes. And there ain't no women. So what's that really say? Who were we trying to impress? So I got my dress outs on and uh, Joe comes up to the R&R &R cell block and he says, uh, we'll see you in 90 days. He knew the things about me that you know. We recognize each other when, when we walk through the door. I ain't interested in getting a job. I ain't going to go see the pro agent. I'm not going to quit using. I'm going to do what I always did because that's what I know how to do. I will trade tomorrow for one hit today, regardless of the consequences. And that's the insanity of the second step. And I need to really get focused on the second step. When I'm not focused on the second step, the other ten will not work for me. Maybe for you, but not for me. Step one is the only step I've ever gotten 100% correct. Hey, one out of 12 ain't bad. I know there's some gurus, you know what I mean? Facebook prophets in here get all of them perfect. But, you know, that ain't my story. I don't know if you like uh, had somebody that got high with you, treated you well, and then when you left, the next person came, you talked shit about them. Oh, it was just me. Okay. Well, I did. <laughs> Of course, I was the only person guilty of my crime in my cell block, too. I couldn't believe all them innocent guys were locked up with me, you know? <laughs> Passive-aggressive behavior for David J. is waiting until you leave to speak my truth. When the dis-ease and the discomfort in my spirit activates my active addiction and my disease is when I talk bad about you. See, I try to get a small dose of self-esteem by putting you down, which only buries me further in the hole once the deliciousness of the moment is over. I uh, tr cleared the last uh, gate and I turned over my right shoulder and I gave the universal sign of appreciation to the guard tower. That works anywhere. Australia, Southeast Asia, that's Jim. He's been all over Europe. You know what I mean? And uh, my friend had been waiting for me, and I didn't say thanks for waiting since 5.30 a.m., taking the day off from work. He's one of those addicts that could work and use. How he did that, I don't know. I had a full-time job eight days a week. My job was to get high. I was good at it, too. I got an apartment building here in about two inches right here. Uh, Create your habit. Go right back to the same spot. I got high that day. I ain't going to go into it. All I can tell you is at the end of the thing that uh, I had put bu bubble gum into the peephole because, you know, they will look through there. <laughs> and uh, I had secured the air conditioner because they will yank it out with the tow, tow truck. <laughs> and I laid the kitchen table down on the sliding glass door track. I also uh, unplugged everything from the wall, and I went after my friend's Amazon parrot with a barbecue fork and a barbecue knife. Come on, Bert. He had three knives in his hands. You know what I mean? I know when somebody's making a move on me, he had three knives. Big ass Bert. Yeah. 
I went and faced the music at the pro office. Now, somebody told me if you drink a gallon of pickle juice, that you will give a clean time. <laughs> Let me save you the pain. <laughs> uh, the pro agent said, uh, are you on dialysis? <laughs> I said, no. He said, would you like to tell me you're dirty before I send that sample out? I, I'm not dirty. Uh, Mr. Johnson, we have a videotape of you committing this crime. Was that you? Wasn't me. You know my homeboy Shaggy. He stole that song from me. Wasn't me. You know what I'm saying? Even caught red-handed, the first thing I do is lie and go into denial. And then give me an opportunity to justify and to get my blame thrower out. I was 15 years old, facing a major case. I had a problem with gasoline and police cars. Not a good mixture. <laughs> and I told the, uh, the judge, I said, Your Honor, if it wasn't, you know, the stenographer or the bailiff, uh, you, sir, no disrespect, and this public <laughs> pretender, None of you would have a job if it wasn't for people like me. <laughs> Got lucky that day, he extended my probation. He also emancipated me. I was 15. So uh, I go to Narcotics Anonymous on New Year's Eve of 1992. I was sitting in somebody's house and we were getting ready to get down. And so, like, there's times when I really feel the spirit, the presence of a loving God when we circle up at the end of a meeting. And we're really thinking about the family member yet to arrive that's suffering. Suffered the way we did. Huh? The humiliation, the incomparable demoralization, the hopelessness, and the loneliness. And we're of one mind and one purpose. And the next thing we know, our home group is flooded with newcomers. Now, some of them may be so special they have a, an invitation from a judge. Just makes them more special, that's all. It's not necessary to have one for that prayer to work, one of them court cards. I sat in that meeting, and I started getting very uncomfortable. It didn't matter that the young black woman who identified herself as a proud lesbian said she was grateful to be clean, and never had she been so happy. And she talked about the humiliation of her disease, the separation from her family. And my thoughts and my feelings came out of her mouth. In the late 1970s, there was a man at the World Service Office that fought for that line. And what is the Narcotics Anonymous program? Regardless of age, race, sexual orientation, God doesn't care what we think. He loves all his children equally. And we need to remember that when the person that's just a little bit different than us walks in a meeting. Huh? If somebody said, now nah, you're a little different than us now, we're going to take away your recovery. Huh? Man, I'd kill myself. There's no use for me to continue to live without Narcotics Anonymous being the centerpiece and the cornerstone of my life. I got this book, and I took it home, and I started to read it, and then I realized the government had figured out a way to read brain waves. <laughs> Because my thoughts, my emotions, and my actions, the court stenographer had put down under the guise of a 12-step program. When I got clean, uh, I had the wrong God, the wrong God. I was a child of a lesser God. Uh, there was a lot of other things going on, and I truly respect and fight for your right to believe whatever it is that you believe. 
It's your God-given right. But apparently, a lot of people capped on my God. Because somebody who said they were representative of my God said they spoke for my God. And apparently they didn't know that you don't have to stick no money in a payphone to have operator assistance to talk to my God. What I found on page 25 of the basic text, it says the right to the God of your understanding is total and free of all catches. For each and every one of us, we need to be mindful and respective. We don't come here to apostatize. We don't argue about religion, politics. We barely get through the weather. <laughs> what took me a while to understand is that the next sentence, the next paragraph says, we need to be honest about our spiritual beliefs from the very beginning if we're going to reap the benefits. It was in the literature that I found out that a lot of things that were said in meetings aren't true. <clears throat> I work in the field of recovery. Is it hay or what is it? <laughs> huh? Whoever got up the earliest this morning has the most amount of clean time. Ask me if I want to trade this day and time in my recovery with the newcomer that got up at 4.30 this morning. Not a chance. They will say, this is a selfish program. Mm, 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 mm. On page 117 of It Works How and Why, it says Narcotics Anonymous is not a selfish program. This is a program of selfless service. And it is in that selfless service that I got the one thing that had eluded me my whole life, the ability for self-care. So please, let's think before we expound our truths to the newcomer. They are like clay. And what we say and how we act and how we treat them will be a major influence on whether we stay or not, whether they stay or not, as well as we stay. Now, I'm not responsible for somebody else picking up, but the first definition of the word suggestion in Webster's Dictionary is to invoke or do influence. And if you could have been here Thursday night at the welcome meeting, you would have seen that genuine care for one another, the singleness of mind and purpose, to put on the very best celebration of Narcotics Anonymous, both in fellowship, informative, about 12 steps, 12 traditions, and 12 concepts. I need to remember why it is that I got chosen and you got chosen. I did not get chosen because I was really good at what I did. Uh, we already discussed my court record. I got chosen because somebody in a home group really cared about the still suffering addict. And so when I see the newcomer, the guy, the man, or the young man, I go over and ask them for his number. Guess why? I've signed a thousand of those phone lists. How many calls you got? I got less than a 5% return. You know what I mean? Wall Street has a better return than that. And they're as greasy as a pork chop. So I get their number, and I ask them, hey, is it okay if I call you? What's a good time to call? You know? I make suggestions like, you know, we read the Just for Today, but there's a, you know, it's like having a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Can you matter having peanut butter and jelly without the jelly? So if I read the Just for Today without the corresponding page, I'm only getting half the message. Huh? If I decide I need to share, expound all my worldly knowledge at the meeting, you know, and then leave, or des decide, you know, I'm going to wait 20 minutes this time, and I'm going to think about what I'm really going to say, and then I'm going to share, and then I'm going to spend the rest of the meeting thinking about, oh, I should have said that. I lost the whole concept and principle that we do this together. I can't, we can't. I uh, 
did the things you taught me to do. I went and got a GED. I got a job. I got a service commitment. Uh, it was before you could, you know, they sold you those little bean grinders. So I went to Costco, ground the beans just right. Got some really nice wham whams and zuzus. Made sure that each chair was three inches apart. <laughs> the literature rack was with so everybody could see that. Uh, made sure that the uh, the greeter had taken a shower. Because uh, of my meeting, you know. <laughs> and then I invited some people in from outside of my area. And they brought this guy with me. And he looked vaguely familiar. I've been ripped off three times in my life. He looked like two of the people that ripped me off. <laughs> Disliked him immediately. I was sure he was a rascal. And uh, we went out to eat. We started hanging out. And I'm over at his house barbecuing. And I finally got around to ask. Uh, well, I was on my way to the bathroom. Why is that, huh? Most of my life has been about bags and bathrooms. You know? So I'm on my way to the bathroom, and uh, I said, hey, Billy, what did you do for work? I'm going down the hallway, and here's this picture of Billy in a green uniform with his tie tucked in and his hat underneath the crook of his arm. And he said, I used to be a correction officer at San Quentin. I said, what block? <laughs> he said, East Block. I said, when? I said, give me back my radio, Billy. <laughs> great sense of humor. In a big, big world, it's a very small world in Narcotics Anonymous. I mean, those of us that have been around for a minute, we know each other, coast to coast and around the planet. You know what I mean? I'm amazed at all the places I've been where Jim knows somebody. Whether they're from the European Union, Russia, Australia, some damn where he knows them because he does service. And as you guys know who do service, the service brings many, many rewards besides just doing the right thing for the right reason. Uh, I am a product of a U.S. soldier and a Korean working girl, and I am a, what they call one of the children of the dust. I was born in Southeast Asia in the early 60s, and it was against U.S. military uh, policy for them to have interracial marriages. And my dad caught the plane home when I was two. And my mom was pretty, and she was busy like you ladies. And I spent a lot of time alone. What I didn't understand is that there are parts of the planet that pride themselves on their ethnic purity. I wasn't allowed to go to school. I wasn't allowed to have a Social Security number. I got told all the time, go home, G.I. Joe. We don't want you, Kennedy. And the kids would pick up dirt, rod, dirt clods and rocks and and throw them at me. And although they hurt, nowhere near did they hurt as the words hurt. We need to be careful what we say to each other and how we say it to each other. Right? There's only one thing that can defeat us. Intolerance and impatience. That word doesn't show up very much in our literature. Defeat. End game. Over. Close the door. There's no reason for this meeting hall to exist. I snatched this piece of fruit off of this cart and it made a mad dash. Each of us knows what it is to be hungry on one level or another. Whether we had the money to cop and our stomachs were chewing out our backbones or we grew up in that kind of poverty. And as I took off of this piece of fruit, I didn't watch where I was going. The next thing I know, I got nailed by this taxi. What is a taxi doing in Southeast Asia? Wherever our military go, so doesn't so does in all our civic equipment. You can be in the middle of the jungle of Amazon or Africa and you'll find yourself a Coca-Cola machine and you'll wonder, how the hell did it wind up here? <laughs> Somebody pushed it out of a plane somewhere. <laughs> I bounced along the surface and uh, in my inventory it came to me that my oldest emotional memory 
the deepest groove in my subconscious is one of paralyzing fear and loneliness. And I felt this black ooze dripping from the top of my head and this guy got out of this cab and he reached down to grab me and I bit his hand. And the next thing I, I knew that I was, I was in the hospital, the military hospital, and my mother was uh, coming to check on me and, you know, I, I actually need a 12-gallon hat because uh, I've had this head of magnanimous proportions my whole life. When I was a kid, I looked like a Q-tip. You know what I mean? <laughs> Can you imagine me with all that gauze on my head? And so my mother, without a sponsor, and without a proven program or recovery and a support group and a home group, made some decisions. She decided that she was going to take me to the orphanage and not tell me. And so we get onto this bus. And we're sitting by the rear stair well. And you know how you guys have had conversations since you, since you came in here? You gave each other a wink, a nod, a light pat on the back, on the hand. And you had a conversation. You didn't say any words. And I said, Mommy, this is not the right bus. And she said, Baby boy, we're going to the beach. we we got to make a stop for us. And then she tapped me lightly on my back. She was sitting next to the window, and I leaned forward at this bus stop. And this guy walked down the aisle of the bus, and he reached down and he grabbed my wrist. She walked to the front of the bus, and she stepped off. My mother did not know how to say goodbye. It doesn't make her a bad person. Sometimes people who love the most don't know how to say goodbye. As you who are parents well, well know how difficult it is to allow your disease to take over and rip your children from your lives and your hearts and your arms. Uh, he secured me, lashed me down to the... Uh, the bar above the seat until I got to this orphanage. And when I was reading that in the basic text that the presence of a loving God has been in our lives all along and we were unwilling to acknowledge that. That's truly my story. I had two PhDs uh, adopt me from Seattle, Washington. And uh, I was afforded every opportunity to go to any private school, to go to any Ivy Lee College, to go to West Point, in Annapolis. I have no excuses, none. And that really sucks. When at the end of the resentment part of the four-step guide, that I have to tell the truth, that I cannot fire up the blame thrower anymore, that I volunteered for 95% of the pain of my life. Mm. Mm. That's self-loathing. Yet when I wrote out the inventory, it wasn't like the other times that the ghosts of the past came to visit. Three inches off my nose in a cell. This time there was something that I hadn't felt in a long time. You want to know why somebody in Palestine straps on a vest full of plastic? Young lady, young man, filled with shrap metal? Because they took the one form of oxygen that every human being on the planet's got to have some degree of hope, and most of us just come in here with a flicker. That self-loathing didn't consume me that day because of the program of the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous. We do better than any government in the world, the UN. And all these highfalutin treatment centers with their percentages and their $60,000 bills, we each and every one of us find out. The meetings are free, and if you want, you can put a couple of dollars in there. See, because I'll put my money into what's important. You want to know what's important to me? Watch what I spend my time, my emotion, my energy on, and my money. Hmm? You know somebody that never missed a day of work but can't make it to their service commitment? I would say you clearly see the priority in their lives. Hmm? Somebody that doesn't show up for a step work assignment? Huh? They're just telling you the truth. We're a fellowship of used car salespeople. Don't listen to what I say. Watch what I do. Watch my feet. <laughs> Billy, the correctional officer, is half Korean. And he married a Korean girl and they had a baby. Oh, did I tell you that uh, the first assignment I gave Billy, the correctional officer, as a sponsor? <laughs> 
you know, I'm sure it didn't hurt him much. I sure did enjoy it. <laughs> he said, would you like to go back to Southeast Asia and see if your mother's alive? God gave me another recovering addict. He gave me a translator and his wife. And with this little piece of tweaker paper, that's the Korean Social Services, they found the orphanage that I went to. And on a cold, rainy day, 2002, while the World Convention was going on in Atlanta, my sponsor, Tom McCall, at that time said, David, the World Convention ain't going to be the same without you. He was being kind. It was wonderful whether I had ever gotten clean or not. But to say those things to me, and for me to carry that with me on my trip, full of anxiety, <clears throat> wondering what I was going to find. As she died, was she in an unmarked grave? Did she have leprosy, like the kind of leprosy I saw when I left? Was she maimed? Did she want nothing to do with me? All I did was represent the physical evidence of all the broken dreams she had of going to America with my father. And so I walk into this orphanage, and this little old Korean lady with this black hair and these silver streaks in her hair and these little small John Lennon glasses comes up and she says, come here. She said, tens of thousands of you have come back as full-grown women and men. And until today, I've told every one of you, I don't know where your parent or parents are. She said, 30 days ago, we received a package in the mail. It's from your mother and she laid out 50-some pictures that were kept in a plastic bag, pristine. I ain't that special, but the fellowship I belong to, the God of my understanding that I have, did for me what I could have never done, that 10,000 other people couldn't get done on their own will. I had an interesting conversation between newcomers last night, talking about many things, and a lot of their facts are right. It was about astrophysics, time-space continuum, you know what I mean, willpower. My willpower has never sustained me against the disease of addiction. I've had my ass kicked and gone back in there for some more. She said, hold on a minute. She walked into the other room and she called my uncle and my aunt. She said, they want to meet you in person. God told me when I got clean, I will give you back the years that my, your addiction took from you. I will restore to you the things of your heart. brought my mom to America and on Mother's Day of 2005 I surrounded her bed with flowers and plants I got from Costco. You know they got this platform right here could fit uh, three shops in Southeast Asia. There's thousands, hundreds of them in a row. That's Jimmy. <coughs> Somehow they all get along. Me, I'd burn all the competition out. Then would be my stand left. You know what I mean? That's the way addicts think. Just me. Okay. I remember that when I get back to my four step. <laughs> Non-confrontational, dislike competition, just David J. I took her to Costco, she froze. She had never been in a store that big. Mm -hmm. Sam's Club. She didn't know what to think. She forgot which way she came in. <laughs> She didn't like it here. It was too fast. It was too busy. But lost dreams awaken and new possibilities arrive. <clears throat> I have a daughter that I left in Oklahoma from those years of growing weed. And when I got clean, I started paying child support. I was asked to stay out of my son's life, and I agreed until he was 18. I had a newcomer staying with me, and uh, he said, uh, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting my car ready. I'm getting ready to drive to Oklahoma City. I said, I'm going to go to this court hearing. All right, they already swabbed me for the DNA, and I've been making payments. I've already been out to see her, and her and her three siblings were already in child welfare, and, and uh, they were having a hearing, and they asked me if I wanted to come, and, and I did. See, Narcotics Anonymous doesn't work on just good days, sunny days. 
days that Charlie Sheen says, winning. <laughs> Narcotics Anonymous works on the hardest of days, on the toughest of days, on the most heartbreaking of days. See, if this only works when things are good, we need to lock the fucking door. You know what I mean? We need to go buy that book. You know what I mean? The Cure for Addiction. It's on sale right now. Hell, he's got it 40% off now. Don't he? I laugh my ass off when I see that commercial. I said, you can either go to the homeless shelter, you can go to the men's program, but you can't stay in my house. I said, remember when you first got here, I made you clap in the living room when I went to the bathroom? Now you don't have to clap anymore, but you can't stay here. <laughs> he said, I love adventures. Can I go with you? That was a bad idea. But we don't know that until afterwards. <laughs> the car broke down in Needles, California. They don't call that town Needles for nothing. Watch where you step from that town. I endured the worst blizzard in northern Arizona. It threw trucks and cars on the road like you throw your Tonka trucks on on Christmas morning. I guess said, here's some cassettes. I'm dating myself. Here's some recovery cassettes. Some of them are men's meetings. You might want to listen to them. Full tank of gas. Here's some money. Here's some cigarettes. And here's some wham whams and zuzus. He says, I love hostess Twinkies. He wasn't lying. <laughs> I wake up and the car is jerking. We're pulling off the highway and all I can see is those orange vehicles with their lights spinning around and around and around. I said, what's up? He said, we're out of gas. I said, we're out of gas. I said, this town has one caution light. This town closed at sunset. <laughs> we pull into a gas station that the lights are off. It's the only gas station. It's the grocery store. And they got a portable building. That's the post office. I am chasing the newcomer around the car. He has become the very most important person in my life. <laughs> Out of the corner of my eye, I see some guy outside turning on his spigot so his pipes don't burst, and he slipped on some ice or something, his flashlight went up. I chased him down like a track star. I should have tried out for the Olympics that year. I ran that guy down. I said, I'll pay you $5, for five dollars a gallon gas. I wish I hadn't said that. You know what I mean? You've got to be careful what you say. Now I go to the gas pump, and that's all I can remember. He said, go back, and uh, I'll meet you at the pump. He turns on the store, let me buy some drinks. Some cigarettes, fill up the car, and uh, offered to pay him extra. He said, no, 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 no. He said, good luck to you. And remember, you could always stop before this town or after. I didn't think he wanted us to come back. <laughs> I woke up in Amarillo, Texas. The first time they had had snow in a long time. My car was going. Rrr, rrr, rrr. I said, what's up? He says, there's nothing. We'll fix it when we get back to California. We drove six more miles before all the oil came out of that brand new motor. It was deja vu uh, when the cowboy pulled over with the big uh, weed sticking out of his mouth, hauling that hay truck. I was chasing newcomer around the car. <laughs> uh, he gave me a ride into town, took me to the automotive shop. They sent a tow truck out. I was in straight denial. I said, it's got to be something minor with this car. Uh, the motor was shot. The newcomer was in my car while I was being towed, playing the radio, smoking cigarettes, waving at people going down Main Street. <laughs> I, I, I'm grateful y'all didn't let me know how sick I was either when I was new. Because uh, that boy didn't have a clue. Couldn't find it with both hands. I miss being able to use Enterprise Car Rental on a secured credit card by $35. And on a dirty bathroom, I got down on the floor and said, I will get loaded. I have this gigantic hole. I have never been there for my daughter. You said you would not put on me more than I can handle. This is more than I can handle. You need to intervene. And if you can't challenge your God, you might want to look at that. I step out of that bathroom, eyes clouded with tears, and here comes the cowboy. And he slams on his brakes. I tell him the story, I verbally throw up at him. You know those people that come regularly, dump to the meeting and then leave? They lost their sponsor's number. It was one of those moments. 
He said, my friend's, best friend's daddy has Alzheimer's. He ain't drove his truck in three years. <laughs> I'm sure you could rent it, which I did. I went back to the hotel, uh, motel room to pick up the newcomer, 35 years old, watching cartoons. <laughs> All the Twinkies were gone. <laughs> And so, I go to Oklahoma, and in this little building, little room, locked room, with the social worker, the step, the foster mom, and my daughter, I start in on this nine step. We do the nine step for two reasons. First of all, it is to show respect to those people, places, and things that we injured. And for them to clearly see by looking into our eyes and listening to our voices and the tone that we're sincere in our amends and we're doing it for ourselves. We're trying to clear the wreckage of the spirit. Because the longer I carry that stuff with me, the less chance I have of quality recovery and real freedom. See? To live and enjoy life as other people do. The pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. Or as we say in Narcotics Anonymous, happy, joyous, and free. Uh, I did not bring any Kleenex with me that day. I should have. I don't think it's legal to blow that big of a bubble out of your nose. <laughs> so I told her she wasn't responsible for having two drug addicts for parents, and she deserved a quality of life. And what could I do to make it right for her? What would she like to see happen in this court case? Because it ain't about me, and it ain't always about us. She said, Daddy Johnson, I'm in 4-H, and I have a pony. I have a Betty Crocker oven, and I have a pink room and a pink bathroom. She said, this lady's going to keep all of us together. Will you please sign the adoption papers? I went back to that motel room with a heavy heart. No meetings there, none. I ironed my clothes and I polished my shoes. I shaved and got a haircut. How do I show up on the toughest days of my life? How much spiritual muscle mass do we really have? Huh? Or is this just another infomercial for money, property, and prestige? Huh? Who can spit the best stuff at the podium? Forget what I say. Watch how I live. I went to court and I signed that paper. Put my left hand on the Bible and raised my right hand. And I gave her this little thing and I said, this is my P.O. box and if you ever want to get a hold of me. I want to tell you that you deserve to be happy, and I wish you the very best. And you have been in my prayers, and you will always be in my prayers. I left that courthouse, and I said, I said, Lord, I'm going to get loaded. I need a meeting. I knew the motel room was going to be trash. I get there. Everything is packed and ready to go. There's ice in the cooler. All the Twinkie wrappers have been wrapped, picked up. The suitcases are ready. I was kind of shocked. He said, are you ready? I said, I am. I'm steaming. I want to take all the self-loathing and anger, and I want to project it onto this newcomer. And I'm telling God, I need a meeting, and I'm driving reckless. And he reached over, and he clicked off the radio, and he said, I was mad, because music's the only thing that can take the tempest out of the emotional storm for me. He said, I've been reading this blue book here. And he says, wherever you have two addicts or more, you can have a meeting. <laughs> Be very, very kind to the newcomer. You never know when they're going to save your butt. I hugged him like this. I said, you really are the most important person. I left Oklahoma City, did a truck run for my buddy and at Jacksonville Airport after I went from Oklahoma City to Long Beach to Jacksonville, I had this feeling on my spirit, what we get from the benefits of the 11th step, and it was telling me to call home. And I have been a man without a home since I left my parents' house. The last time I saw my parents was in 1981, or my siblings. And I tried to reach out to him since I've been clean, and I've been clean a while. And I called, and 
I was just going to leave a voice message. My parents are each other's best friends. They've been to 142 countries together. And they, uh, how much time I got left, Greg? Five minutes? She said, your daddy's got cancer. I want you to come home. I went home to take people back and forth to the airport to pick up the liquor bottles, empty the trash. And I got asked to eulogize my father. That same afternoon, my daughter called me from Oklahoma City. And my friend Jimmy walked me through that whole process of being reunited, and she came to live with me. Today, I stand before you, and I will tell you, there is no reason in the world, once we make the choice to be a member of Narcotics Anonymous, to ever get loaded. Although we have one promise, there are many warranties in the basic text, and I challenge you to find them. I got stage four cancer. My time is short. Today is a great day. My glass is over half full. Never have I been so happy. And I'm absolutely sure that just for today there is nothing to fear. And that it is much sweeter on the other side and a much bigger meeting. I hope I get to be the coffee maker. So I want to tell you, for all the pain that I've gone through, the surgeries, the chemo that I'm still doing, I ain't doing the chemo for me anymore. I'm doing it for my loved ones. I love being clean. Narcotics non a squeaky clean. And if you don't believe that one addict can make a difference from Sun Valley or somebody special in your life, or as I call Rollin the Pied Piper of Narcotics Anonymous, uh, give him a book bag and it's on. I'm starting a meeting this Wednesday in Roswell, New Mexico, called Close Encounters of the Clean Kind. <laughs> Stop by, stay a while, kick off your shoes. <laughs> Narcotics Anonymous gave me the best years of my life. And if I think that at the end of the road that I get to spit in the face of the God of my understanding in the program of Narcotics Anonymous that saved countless of tens of thousands of lives, 143 countries, 42 languages, I didn't deserve to ever spend a day here. This ain't for the faint of heart. And this ain't an easy program. It's simplistic for even knuckleheads like me. We keep the promise until we cross over. And if somebody lays some punk ass line on you, tell them you haven't read our literature. Day clean is a day one. Never have we known such joy, happiness, freedom, or intimacy. Never have we had such big dreams and such great friends. And we would be damned if the example we set for the newcomer is that we got loaded in the, in the last two minutes of the fourth quarter. I want to thank the Fort Worth Convention Committee. I want to tell each and every one of you that just like Jimmy Kennan, you can and will make a difference. May the ultimate authority richly bless you. And may you know that passion you knew in the youth of your recovery. Mahalo for letting me share.